According to the Prison Policy Initiative, the United States locks up more people per capita than any other nation with an estimated 2 to 3 million locked up, many of which are for nonviolent offenses like narcotic sales or use. Now banned from the United States, Sean Atwood, the former stockbroker turned ecstasy dealer who served five years in Arizona jails, two of which under the controversial Sheriff Joe Apreo, rose to international fame through a blog he anonymously wrote during his time inside, titled John's Jail Journal, which documented his experiences behind the wall. John Stone recently spoke with the prison reform activist and asked him how he would describe the overall apparatus of the war on drugs as seen within the prison system. Well, Reagan accelerated Nixon's war on drugs. And if you go up right up and through Clinton's, then you've got hundreds of thousands of nonviolent drug arrests. Drug, um, sorry, you've got hundreds of thousands of nonviolent drug offenders getting incarcerated in the 80s and the 90s. If you look at the racism, though, it's completely off the scale. I think we've got right now one in 20 something uh, black adult males in the prison system, which is completely disproportionate with the black population being around 12, 13 percent. You know, I was in prison in Arizona. The whites were a minority. The majority was Mexicans, Mexican-Americans, and blacks. And before I got arrested, the news had led me to believe that prisoners were pedophiles, serial killers, murderers, locked them up and throw away the key. But once I got in there, I saw it was the warehousing of low-level drug users for profit, all these corporations making money off the back of it, private prisons getting $50,000 a year of taxpayers' money per prisoner per year. I saw it was the biggest house of the mentally ill. I saw all the people of color in there. Women became the fastest growing prison population under these drug laws. There's almost half a million women in prison in America right now. And every way you turn, they're making money off you. I made a collect call back home to the UK. And it, it, my parents were charged about 60 pounds, um, almost $100. So basically, the war on drugs, they've used it to warehouse society's most vulnerable people and to just make profits off the backs of them. Let's talk about your prison experience because it's fascinating that you, uh, you ended up going to prison for nearly six years uh, for basically selling ecstasy, if I'm correct. So what was it, what were the ultimate charges? Yeah, it was my own silly fault for getting involved in drugs. But what were okay, the I pled guilty to money laundering. Oh, the original charges were conspiracy um, crime syndicate, running a criminal enterprise. I had a lot of felony twos. In the end, we got that plea bargained down to like class three and class four felonies. And then you, you're essentially walking into prison in Arizona and talk about some of the, the horrors that, were, that you witnessed and, were, and had to basically be a part of. Obviously, people see prison shows, but it's difficult to, to convey quite how uh, dehumanizing the experience is, um, you had basically had to survive by, by, by collaborating with certain gangs. And you know, talk about basically what, what that experience uh, was. How did you survive it? Well, I was surprised that 90% of the prisoners were shooting up heroin and crystal meth. And these were mostly drug criminals. Then we put them where, where there's the hardest drugs. It's the gangs. The big business in the prison system is the drugs for the gangs. Now, in America, it's all racially controlled. So because I'm white, I came under the control of the neo-Nazi Aryan Brotherhood prison gang. As soon as I walked in, three skinheads come up to me, and they're like, hey, we want a word of you in this cell back here. And you know you've got no choice, otherwise you're going to get your head smashed against the toilet. So I go in the cell, they close the door behind me, they got me up against the wall at the back, there's no way out. And they're like, what are your charges? What are your charges? And I've read my charges, but I don't understand what they mean. So I say, I'm not quite sure what they mean. They're like, what do you mean you don't know what they mean? Are you a chomo? Are you a chomo? I don't know what a chomo is either. Chomo is child molester. They were about to really, you know, give me a beating down. But in the end, I pulled out my charge sheet, showed it to them, and they left me alone because I was in for drug offenses. Now, some charges are K-O-S by the gang, which means kill on sight, such as paedophile stuff. Other charges are SOS, smash on sight, such as drive-by shootings, because women and kids sometimes get hit. So anyone coming in with a sex offense or a crime against a woman or a child, right away, a gang is going to try and murder them. At the very least, they're going to smash them. That's called convict justice. 
Once you get through that interrogation, you have to go and meet the head of the gang. Explains all the rules you must follow, or the whole gang will smash you. If someone calls you a punk or hits you, you've got to fight them on the spot. You must take showers, or they'll smash you for bad hygiene. Can't go making friends with the guards, they'll smash you for snitching. Can't go sitting at the tables with other racists, they'll smash you for that. Everything you take for granted about your safety is reversed in there. They're constantly looking for people to beat up, because that's how they earn their reputations and their tattoos. It's called putting work in to earn your political ink. And the more serious the act of violence, higher up in the gang are the tattoos that they earn. To be a full member of the Aryan Brotherhood, to get that tattoo, you have to murder someone in the jail for them. And the murders aren't only conducted by inmates, by, by inmate, inmate to inmate murders. You actually talk about having seen guards murdering inmates. What is the, A, a how does that happen and, and, uh, and is there no reprisal for it? Well, National Geographic Channel broadcast my story as an episode of Locked Up Abroad, and they researched the murder rate in Sheriff Joe Arpaio's jail, and the death rate, sorry. 62 people died um, over five years around the time I was there. And some of those were people murdered by the guards, mentally ill prisoners. One was Brian Crenshaw, classified as a partially blind shoplifter, failed to produce his ID for the evening meal, the guards pulverized him, broke his neck, severe internal injuries, he went into a coma, he died over a month later. Scott Norberg, mentally ill, gets in the guards start beating him, electrocuting him with tasers. Female guard tried to stop it. Stop beating him, his face has turned blue. They push you off, they keep beating him. Inmates watch you from the holding cells, start yelling, why are you still beating him, he's already dead. And even after that, his face turned blue, dead. They continued to beat the corpse, the, the, like, a, like a pack of wolves on this guy. Family members of the victims of the guards sued the jail and got compensation. And you ask me what consequences there were for the guards afterwards. Some of those guards were actually promoted and got pay rises by Sheriff Joe Arpaio after being found responsible in federal court for murdering those prisoners. That's shocking. So essentially everything that, we, that Americans assume yeah. is going on with prison systems is the opposite. I mean, people basically believe, well, we have, to have, we have to be tough on crime because then that's the only way to reform people is to send them to these jails when, in fact, the jail system is perpetuating uh, violence, drug abuse, uh, extortion, every crime essentially that's committed outside and probably uh, amplified and made worse, made more barbaric. So. What would your advice be? I'm sure you would be someone who would advocate not only decriminalizing but also legalization of drugs as a good step forward to a decrease the overall prison population in a country like America. Well, I asked the guard how they got away with all this stuff. You know, dead rats in the food, cockroaches crawling all over us at night, guards murdering prisoners, and he said the world has got no idea what really goes on in here. And the media are responsible, because in the media all you ever hear is extreme crimes on one side, paedophiles, serial killers, and how easy it is in prison, it's a holiday camp, and they've got luxuries on the other side. But the reality is, um, you know, when you get in there, you see what's really going on. Young people come in. Back then, you had almost a million arrests a year for weed. Not dealers, 90% possession. Young people come in, busted for weed, graduate to heroin, Graduate to crystal meth, start sharing dirty needles, getting hepatitis C. Two thirds of the prisoners had hepatitis C where I was at. 90% were shooting up illegal drugs in the, in the prison. They get neo Nazi tattoos, swastikas on their foreheads. And when they make their criminal connections in prison, and when they get out, they are proper full on criminals. And I just saw nearly everybody who got released come right back. So if you look at why prisons and the police were started in the very first place, Sean. Robert Peel started the, uh, the police in London here with the express purpose to stop person A from hurting person B. And crime for millennia has been defined as murder, robbery, rape, etc., where there's an actual victim. But when the drug laws were introduced in the last century, we started to warehouse low-level drug users Who's a low-level drug user hurting? Themselves. And we put them in a place where we treat them like animals and the hardest drugs are readily available. 
So if this has got to be solved somehow, yes, drugs should be legalized. The government should take control of it and sequester it from young people. But in the meantime, policymakers should be looking at Amsterdam, Portugal, in Holland right now. They're closing prisons down because they've got spare capacity. The kids don't want to go out and, and smoke weed and, and do hash cakes because that's what their parents' generation were doing. It's not cool because they've got a sensible drug policy. In Portugal, they said that if you decriminalize heroin, addicts will be all over the roads and kids will be doing it. What kind of an example does this set? The police were warning all of this. What happened was the addicts were no longer scared of getting arrested, so they came forward to the health teams and Portugal has reduced its heroin addicts from over 100,000 to less than 50,000. They've, they've halved it. But there's no money in helping people and helping society like this. There's money in fighting a war on drugs and locking people up. And each side of the political fence gets massive contributions from the private prisons, prison guard unions, telephone contractors for the prisons. And on and on it goes, you know, nobody's able to put the brakes on it. During the eighth